The sound of the stream winds its way through your head, submerging your thoughts beneath its bubbling surface. You find yourself following its path, cascading down the cavern walls, across its tra travelled path, over the edge, spilling, tumbling down, too late to turn back or grab hold of anything of substance. You fall away into the void, away into the blank, consuming emptiness. The stream falls silent. You stand alone outside the alcove. The only source of light comes from the dying embers of the fire, a fading, molten red glow. As you watch something stirs beneath the remains, the rock splits and gapes open, as if being sucked inward. From within, an ashen arm reaches out, its fingers searching for purchase, looking for a way to haul itself free. You feel the urge to flee, but your legs will not obey. The faceless figure, born of cinders, raises an outstretched finger. Ashes peel and flutter from its crumbling grey skin. As you stand transfixed, the figure disintegrates into a whirl of ashes. The flurry of dark flakes twists and dives in the dead air, pulling the fragments together, spinning itself into a tight cord, rearing like a serpent. It dives towards you, wrapping itself around your limbs. You feel the heat of the embers where it touches your skin, trying without success to break free from the bonds. The cord pulls tight, dragging you, inch by resisted inch, toward the hole where the fire once lay. As you're forced closer to the rim, you hear the rush of wind coming from within, compelled by ashen binding, you take another step, expecting to feel the buffeting gusts against your face. Instead, you feel nothing but the impending pull of the void. You look down over the edge and see the stars of the night sky. The final step awakens you with a gasp. Another restless night. I didn't believe it was possible, Alice says, adjusting her fox mask beside you. But you're an even more restless sleeper than Ayoko. Sorry, you mumble as images in your mind fragment into meaningless colours and sounds dispersing into nothing. She tilts the mask back as she rubs an eye. No, look, I should apologise. That was dismissive. Forgive me. It's been a draining couple of days. Alice looks at you, her smile expressing sympathy. Camel, if you need to talk about it... I'm not sure. It's already slipping away, you say, sighing. Sad to say, we're not short on unpleasant experiences for my mind to dwell upon, even in sleep. She nods, lowering her mask once more, giving your shoulder a supportive squeeze with her free hand. Too true, she says, stretching her legs. Suppose I'd see how our other troubled dreamer got on by the fireplace. Gather your possessions. The three of you sit around the cold ashes of the fire, mask tilted to allow the consumption of stale bread. You look around, counting the surfaces and materials that would be softer than the chunks of rigid dough, battling your overworked jaw. The count reaches three before Oko's voice disrupts your idle game. Wonder how it looks, he says, face lit from below by Alice's lantern. Up there. I imagine it's only getting worse. Elkin nods his head in solemn agreement. Aye. You're unlikely to ever lose coin on that wager. The illumination vanishes from Ayoko's face as Alice stands, pulls the lantern up with her. I may still be waking up, but is it getting lighter in here? She asks, pointing outward at Karen's main chamber. You lift off your mask for a better view, trying to discern whether the blurred crags and outlines of ledges are real or aspects of your imagination. Put the lantern out, you suggest. Alice distinguishes the flame. Rather than condemning you to the darkness of the previous night, it leaves the cavern a pale shade of grey. Searching for the source, you realise that the distant opening through which water spills into the caves is now casting a dim, morning glow. New pathways unseen in the restricted bubble of the lantern's light now reveal themselves. One in particular catches your eye, curling its way down toward a deep cleft in the wall. 
think that's our way onward? Alice asked, her eyes spying the rear, the very same opening. If it is, I'm sure those who trodden these paths before us will mark it, Ioko says, joining the two of you and peering into the receding gloom. Checking that you have all your belongings with you, the three of you head out of the camp, scramble down the pathway. The white carving of an arrow, just above, about visible in dawn light, filtering into the cavern, confirms the path forward. You wish it had not, because the narrow slit in the rock face is barely wide enough for a single person to fit through. Even then, only if that person were to turn sideways. Alice relights her lantern and holds it up to the entrance. Judging by what little you can make out, the passage beyond is in no hurry to widen, but with no other options, you will have to resign yourself to squeezing through. Ayoko expels a long breath beside you. <sighs> I'll go first, he says. Alice, follow with the lantern, so I have some notion what lies ahead. Adjusting the pouches on his belt, your colleague steps into the breach and begins to inch his way through. As the material from his robes start to disappear from sight, Alice turns herself to the side, hooks the lantern to her hip, and pushes her way after him. Taking a last look at the dripping stalactite formations of the cavern chamber, you suck in your chest and stomach and follow your colleagues, feeling the tight rock walls scrape against your back and shoulders as you inch your way into the gap. You're thankful for wherever accident of nature left a wider space at the head height, still too narrow to allow you to turn your head with any ease, but broad enough for your mask to pass through without getting snared. Closing your eyes, you continue to shuffle onward, trying to concentrate on anything else besides the sensation of all the fluids in your body being wrung out between two on the yielding wall. Okay, and speaking of fluids and liquids, I am going to drink some tea. nice I think about the other adversities I've overcome I think is the right choice here at least for at least for Gamel you face greater hardships than this and emerge on the other side these walls can squeeze you constrict you try to contort you to their own rigid image but you will endure you must endure to your relief, Ioko gives the call up ahead. The way widens once again, leaving enough room to stand and move with relative freedom. You pull yourself out of the tight rift to find Alice lamenting a torn pouch. You must have got caught on something, she says, trying to salvage what few herbs remain inside the ruined container. Follow the passage. You press on together, travelling only a short distance before the passageway diverges in two. The leftward path is marked with the familiar white symbols of the smugglers, while the right appears to slope and curve upward. Seems clear which way we should proceed, Ayoko says with a shrug. Let's go. Hold on, Alice says, silencing him and stepping closer to the rightward entrance. She raises the lantern and peers inside. Do you hear that? She asks. You tilt your head closer, hearing nothing at first. Then a faint, distant pulse, rhythmic and steady. A heartbeat beneath the thornback hollow. Is that drumming? You say, not quite willing to believe what your ears are telling you. Whatever it is, Ayoko says, our route is clear. We follow the markings. If there are people down here, it could be prudent to investigate, says Alice, though her voice betrays a nervousness as to what they m that may entail. We'll have to return this way, Ioko replies, if you're still eager to go chasing strange sounds, that may be the time. For now, we should keep tracing the steps of those we know to have broken the quarantine.
Okay, so again, another interesting decision. But one answer leaps out at me. Um, and it is this one. If someone is there, they may have departed before we can return. Let's investigate now. With Aoki still grumbling in your ear, you take the right-hand passage. The trace, the track begins as a gentle climb but soon turns steeper. You find yourselves clambering on thick roots, protuberances with the tenacity to burrow the way through solid rock. As you ascend still farther, the pathway appears to end, blocked by a slab of stone. The illumination of the lantern reveals a gap at the top of the barrier, which stands a few inches taller than a person. Using indents and extrusions as grips for your hands, you pull yourself up over the top, then turn to hold your arms and assist the next climber. All the while the rhythmic sound seems to deepen. It beats in your chest with an insistence that nags at your nerves. Your colleagues say little, but you know they must feel it too. At last the ground beneath you begins to level off. The passage ahead begins to take on a new character too. Gone are the natural formations of rock, replaced by archways and stonework of human construction. One fades into the other in an almost seamless transition. The pulsing beat is louder still, throbbing in your head like an infected wound. A chanting chorus of voices joins the rhythm. Dweller in torn root and branch, Dweller of within and without, Dweller who rides and soars. Your motion for the others to stay low, creeping forward through the archway ahead, the passageway in furrows, opening out onto a narrow stone balcony. A pair of steps leads down on either side, wrapping around the edges of a circular arena, with more archways leading off in all directions. Lit torches cast their glow over the dirt floor. In the centre of the arena you see a dozen figures, each dressed in tattered robes, caked in earthen soils and crudely decorated with sprigs and flora. One woman leaves a scattering of pine needles in her wake. Another member of the congregation wears a gnarled vine, curled all the way from their left forearm to their shoulders. Four of the group wield short, paired chunks of wood, striking them against a plated mass of roots that encroaches through one of the archways, creating the incessant pulsing beat. Dweller in body and mind, dweller in earth and sky, dweller take our dreams. Keep watching transfixed. As you observe from the balcony, you see a pair of figures with torn dappled sleeves move to a small altar in front of the mass coils of roots. The rhythm seems to crawl as they undertake their preparations. Your view is, is obscured, but they appear to be mixing the draught of crushed herbs. I'd love to learn what's in that brew, Alice whispers at your side. You nod in agreement and stay crouched, working your way slowly toward the nearest flight of steps. The noise below obscures any telltale sound from your robe dragging against the stonework. You lean forward over the stairs with tentative motions, trying to get a better look at the ingredients being prepared on the altar. But as you adjust your footing, you dislodge a loose portion of the masonry. In a desperate effort to stop the fist-sized portion of stone tumbling away, you try to lunge for it. Your fingertips brush against the edge, leaving you to watch in dread as it clatters down to the floor and rolls against the foot of one of the chanters. He turns, looking upward at you, and begins to yell, Intruders! Spies in the dwellers' halls! The drumming ceases. Half a dozen figures, fingers point your way as the chants devolve into a mass of raised voices. For a moment you enter the idea of entertain the idea of fleeing back the way you came, but the chance passes in an instant as several of the ragged group bound up the stairs to within touching distance. You, Ioko and Alice stand up, using your hands to express no ill intention. You are outnumbered here, but the participants seem rattled by your presence, and you hold a somewhat defensible position. On the altar the curious concoction stands unattended.
Um, this is tough. We tried intimidation, and it's worked sometimes, but it, it worked against a guy who was desperate. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's worked against um, someone who is who was desperate for food and wasn't looking all the best but then it didn't work against uh, a soldier who was nervous and certainly didn't work against a, a a higher ranking soldier who was taking no guff from us so hmm i'm not sure our presence is going to carry us through on this but it's either between that and giving him the handbane I think I want to keep hold of the henbane, so I'm going to try and intimidate them into backing down. I tried to intimidate the cultists into backing down. We're not spies, you say, nor are we intruders. As physicians of the crown, we have the authority to investigate where we please. You allow us to check this space for signs of the waking death, or face severe consequences. The man nearest to you, a necklace of withered flowers around his neck, puts his foot on the step closer to you. His movements are lithe and cautious, like that of a curious animal. Children of the Dweller, do you not recognise your crown, Mast Healer? You'll find no plague here, only a cauldron of dreams, sizzling and ready for the Dweller's maw. As you speak, you watch the man's pupils grow fat. He's either relishing his own words, or the group already imbibed some herbal stimulants. While you try to decide which, Alice speaks up behind you. Your cooking dreams? What does that mean? She asks, receiving only laughter in reply. Listen, you say, grabbing the man's wrist. We're just the first to discover your grotto. Militia know we're down here, and so does Abbot Quelm. Let us do our work, or you'll soon be standing shoulder to shoulder with armed guards and sage monks. Judging by his expression, it appears the cultist has taken your exaggerated threat to heart. The swing of his free arm catches you by surprise, almost knocking the mask from your face. His wrist slips from your grasp, allowing him to gallop back down the steps, issuing a panicked cry. They come with a warning! The false deity and the thralls are coming here! We must flee! The cultists scatter. Oh, go away. Thank you. And what have we got next? You see figures bolt through every archway, disappearing into a multitude of tunnel. Those running by the altar pause to snatch up the potion. Its ingredients and other objects too small to recognize. Powerless to stop them, you watch as they vanish down separate paths. Behind your back, you hear Alice curse. As you descend the steps to investigate what few traces may remain, you see a lone figure beneath a pair of torches, slim and short. They stand with their hands folded behind their back, head bowed. A circle of pale flowers rest over the hood of their robes. You didn't flee with the rest, you say. Why? I know you intend me no harm. I have nothing to fear, they reply. The tone of the voice is familiar to your ear. And you get closer, you see that their robes are adorned with thorns. What have you been doing down here? Alice asks, examining the spilled and spoiled aftermath on the altar. Who is this dweller? Is your weird little sect responsible for... Oh, it's Ioko. Is your weird little sect responsible for the waking death? Ioko adds, jabbing a finger of accusation towards the robe-clad figure. All of your questions shall be answered, they reply. The voice has grown in confidence than when last you heard it. This role has given their tone, purpose and clarity, even before he removes the flowered um, crown and pulls back the hood. You know who resides inside the, the robes. Awen Blake, you say. Doctors, he replies on a nod.
Yeah, it's kind of good to see him again, so let's say that. I'm pleased we've had another chance to meet. It's good to see you. Eowyn's serious expression cracks and his laughter fills the chamber. I'm sorry, he says. It's good to see you too, but these surely are not the circumstances either of us would have envisaged. I can admit to that, you reply with a smile. What exactly does lead the heir of the Blake family to put on thorn robes and conduct secret rituals in underground chambers. At the mention of his family, any sense of joy relieves Aylwin's face. He sighs and shakes his head. I would do almost anything to escape that fate. My whole life I have been groomed, chastened, corrected, all for a path I did not wish to tread. Does this feel like the right path? you ask. It feels... Better, he replies. When I wear these robes, when I hear the dweller's voice. The deity has spoken to you? Elwin nods and holds up his palm. In the center, scarred into the flesh, sits a circle of thorns. I carry their mask, Mark. A serene calm crosses his face. Receiving it made me feel whole, wanted. I'm happy for you, Aylwin, you say, a note of caution in your otherwise optimistic tone. You do not seem sure, he replies. I... You begin to say, considering your words with care. Just be careful. The dweller will guide me, just as their voice guided me below the mayoral crypt to this place. These passageways lead back to the manor, you ask. Who knows about this? Myself, my sect, perhaps others, through whom the dweller wishes to act. The mayor? He laughs. No, mother is quite ignorant of the history beneath her feet. Could any of your sect be issuing, using tunnels to smuggle people out of Thornback Hollow? Awen looks shocked. We would never aid the spread, spread of this plague. The waking death starves us of dreams. It hurts citizen and dweller alike. Okay, continue our questioning. You still haven't answered my question, Alice says. What exactly is this ritual you seek to perform? Eowyn closes his eyes, taking the time to compose his next reply. When he speaks, his tone is soft and cordial. We are preparing for the feeding of the maw. It begins with a brief abstinence from sleep to ensure that those participating will be tired when the time comes. The drumming keeps us awake. He nods toward the roots and a pair of discarded chunks of wood. Then all but one consumes the elixir and we offer our dreams as sustenance. The one who remains keeps watch over those who slumber. slumber. Offer your dreams, you ask, to the dweller in turns? He nods. That is correct. The dweller is nourished by our dreams and in turn directs their divine energy to the soil, to the oaken forest, to the land we work and cultivate. That sounds like the Sage of Oak, Ioko says. Ewan opens his eyes. You have been misled, he says, by a false deity and their lying thralls. It is the dweller in thorns who keeps the oak trees standing tall, who brings life to this land and to its town. His brow forms a frown. The dweller has grown thin, robbed of their nightly offerings by this waking death. And how do you know all this? Alice asks. I read, he replies. I listen when the deity calls. This feeding of the maw, you say, is it enough to keep your deity content? Awen shakes his head. The children of the dweller are few in number. They are the destitute and abandoned, eager for purpose but fearful. As you may have seen, even with our dreams made vivid by the elixir, the dweller hungers still. While they suffer, so too will Thornbrook Hollow wither away. Alice takes you aside, keeping her voice low. Gamel, do you believe a single word of this? I certainly think he believes it, 
there's value in respecting that. She nods. A reasonable approach. We may yet need his cooperation. Get back here! Ayoko shouts. Shout bursts through your conversation. You see Eowyn fleeing through one of the archways, your colleague in pursuit. With Alice at your side, you hurry to the point of escape, but through... But though you can hear quick footsteps against stonework, there's no sign of either of the two men. After a minute or so, you see Ayoko returning down the passageway. He's a nimble one, he says between breaths. It's a maze in there. I'll never find him. Unfortunate, Alice says, but there's little else we can do here. The concoction is lost. She gestures at the small, damp patch of earth by the altar. Agreed, you say. We know where Elwyn lives, and it seems the sect has no intention of abandoning the town of its deity. Let's return to the trail left by the smugglers. Time to depart. Together you climb the steps, back to the balcony, and begin the slow descent back to the point where the trail diverged. With the torches of the sect's chamber far behind, Alice's lantern guides your way. A deity who consumes dreams, she says. Fanciful or not, I hope we haven't erred by allowing that sect to flee. Our position and authority is rather isolated down here, Ayoko reminds her. And we didn't exactly allow them to flee, he pauses. They at least seem to have no love for the waking death. If we're to believe Eowyn Blake... That gives me some comfort. Eowyn's involvement is no secret now, you say. We can plan further steps against this cult, if we deem them necessary. But for the time being, we should return to original task. Raising your hand, you gesture to the smuggler's mark, denoting the left-hand passage. Go back on the trail. Ioka is the first to notice the rats. Furry bodies scampering along the base of the tunnel wall. Eyes shining black as they catch the light of the lantern. He points to another, hauling itself onto one of the narrow roots that pokes through the compacted earth and rock that surrounds you. It struggles for a time, back legs waggling against the fine until they find purchase, then scuttles along the length of the root, outpacing you into the darkness ahead. Bloody things would always get in our baggage wagons, ruin our grains. Brain supplies, he recalls. But if you're already out of food, a rat is like venison for a hungry soldier. That's what I love about your war stories, Alice says, calling back from her position at the head of the trio. The glamour. Nothing worthy of more glory than securing a few plump rats. For starving troops, he replies. You find it difficult to tell whether his pride is sincere. I ponder what rodents would be eating in these tunnels. Probably the bodies, right? What would they even be eating down here, you wonder aloud. Besides us, if that light goes out, Ioko replies, nodding in the direction of the lantern. Not sure, unless crops can grow beneath the ground ground now or oh, beneath the ground now you walk on behind the others listening for the chittering in the gloom in the dim light you see the passageway broadening looking up you can no longer see the jagged surface above you stretch your arm as high as it will go but torch but the torch only oh touch why did I think that was torch let me read that again then um you stretch your arm as high as it will go, but touch only air with your fingers. The murk beneath the vanished ceiling still draws your eye as you almost collide with Ioka's back. Your colleagues have paused, their attention drawn by something further than the passage. Let's step around to see. With the tunnel now wide enough to hold the three of you abreast, you stand with your colleagues, peering at the shapes and shadows outlined by the lantern's light. The cavern ahead is far smaller than the one in which you spent the night, reminding you in size of a modern dwelling. Where a far wall once existed, you can make out a vast section of root, its tubed form sweeping inside the chamber like a curled back of a great slumbering cat. As illuminating 
illumination passes along its length, you see a transitioning green hue, exposing strange vessels beneath the surface. Blinking as your eyes strain against the dark, you could swear you see this exterior stretch and contract. You look again and the root is still. The largest one we've seen yet, Ayoko says. You see him tilt his head upward, as if in a futile effort to see through the earth above. Root that size, we must be close to the sanctuary. Look there. You follow Alice's pointing finger as she holds the light steady in her own, in her other hand. The root is split, oozing a viscous li liquid from a gouged crack that runs several feet along its horizontal length. Thin ropes of the substance dangle from the wound, presenting an organic tableau of cavern stalactites. A thick pool of the stuff has seeped halfway across the floor of the tunnel, where it sits stagnant and sap-like in texture. This time you are the first to notice the rats. Three small corpses lie close to the punctured root, their fur matted and dull. Wherever afflicted these rodents, you say, we shouldn't take we should take care to uncover. The roots, Alice muses, if they are drawing water from the Thornback River, then whatever killed these rats could already have contaminated the wells, Ay Ayoko says. Silence, glances exchange between mass physicians and wordless, wordless recognition. This scene demands further study, even at the risk of contamination. Mm. We're going to use our own skills, because we've been, we've been delegating to them um, too often. I'll make closer, more detailed observation in order to formulate a medical hypo hypothesis. You take the lantern from Alice's hand and make your way with care toward the fractured root, touching your wolf mask for reassurance. With no way of knowing whether any of the elements before your contaminants, the situation demands caution, but few medical strides have been made with an overabundance of hesitation. Still, those pernicious thoughts take hold, compelling you to work with haste. You waste no time in stepping over the deceased rats, holding up the lantern to the fractured r running along the length of the root, eyes darting back and forth. You search for anything that may be considered a worthwhile sample. You study the viscous liquid, hardening into a crust, where it has gushed from forth from the spit plant matter and take note of some white stripling along the fringes of the same opening. It appears to be blossoms of miniature uh, lichen. Conducting a quick reassessment in your head, you decide to retrieve plant matter, liquid and lichen alike. You set the lantern down by the root and pull out a thin scraping tool from your robes. A small leather pouch follows. Careful. In your haste to retrieve a useful sample, your exhausted hands slip and damage the lichen, cursing and with a cold, anxious sweat forming on your cheeks and brow, you try to salvage what you can. It's not as much as you'd wish to harvest, and you'll have to trust that the material will not degrade further when removed from its underground environment. With an apologetic tone, you explain to your colleagues what happened. The conditions are appalling, Alice says, trying to reassure you. Don't blame yourself. This sample may still divulge the secret it holds. Or it may just kill rats, Ayoko adds, in which case little has been lost. Behind your mask, you manage to raise a smile. With a gesture and a nod, you remind the others that there are still further tunnels to be walked before you can return to the ground above. Trudge onward. You depart by the other passageway, leaving behind the vast curled root. It's your last glimpse of organic material for some time, as the walls and ceiling of the tunnel exhibit nothing of note besides periodic symbol from the smugglers who preceded you. While you walk, you try to determine your location relative to, to the streets of Thornback Hollow above. Using the root alcove as a point of reference from the sanctuary, you assume you are now heading west, 
toward the cliffs. I've been mulling something over, Alice says, breaking what had become a lengthy silence. The smugglers have walked this path. We don't know how many times, but we do know that there are operations like we began after the outbreak, so... If the lichen had some link to the plague, it's presumably not contained within these tunnels. There's plenty to smuggle from Thornbrook Hollow besides people, Ayoko says. This town sits on the pathway to the ocean, and I bet there are enough merchants trading enough goods for some to require more unofficial routes out of town. To my eyes, their symbols and markings look far older than the start of the outbreak. So, once again, there's not much we can deduce, she replies. Just that Welt sings a powerful tune. Your colleagues retort, spurs under a period of silence, punctuated only by the sounds of exertion and the soles of boots against rock. As you begin to wonder how this tunnel can still persist without ending, a gust of cold wind finds its way into the folds of your robe, causing you to shiver. The candle flame of Alice's lantern flickers and spins, as if being pulled in different directions by invisible strings. Up ahead, you see the grey hue of winter daylight. See the sky once again. The landscape beneath you was obscured by a thick layer of snow. Flakes the size of leaves still fall from the sky, covering the oak forest with a heavy white veil. Even at the entrance of the cliffside cleft, where you find yourself standing, a drift of several inches is blown in from the outside. In the distance, you see, you think you can see splashes of colour between the flurries, glimpses of the tents and banners of Baron Moreland, beleaguered camp. You glance down, looking at the precipitous step cliffs, slick with snow and ice, for any possible route of descent, with a rope, perhaps. But where then? Even if the snows were to abate and the traveller were savvy enough to avoid patrols, making it as far as nearby Micklewood would be an achievement of no small fortune. You look back at the woods in grim calculation. How many more bodies of desperate escapees do their snow-laden canopies conceal? Satisfied that you have viewed all that can, you can from your perch, you stamp, step back into the tunnel, preparing yourself for the substantial journey back to the old quarter entrance. Think the Baron can last the winter, Alice asks, gesturing in the general direction of the camp banners, before turning her attention to replacing the candle inside her lantern. He'll outlast us, Ayoko replies. If I have any measure of that man, he'll have his soldiers eating one another before he abandons the siege. He's a pompous bastard, but he's loyal to the crown. Failure would cost him any ambition. What about you, Gamel? You've spoken with him more recently than all of us. To betray the crown through desertion would be treason. The Baron will persist. For crown and realm, Ioko says, his tongue thick with cynicism. Some of us still uphold those ideals, you reply. I'm sure the crown is forever indebted to your service, he says, sounding no more sincere. Oh, I didn't know we were actually committing ourselves to the crown. I thought we were just making, giving an opinion of him, because he's, like the Baron is definitely dedicated to the crown. But I guess we've dedicated ourselves there as well, okay. Another gust of wind spirals along the passageway, ruffling the hems of your robes. The movements are weaker now, already fading as you get farther away from the crack to the outside world. You're ready yourself for another few hours of walking through dim, silent caverns. Well, I know this much, Ayoko says. I fought in her army for the best part of my youth, but that loyalty to the crown counted for nothing once I was out. Her, Alice asks, thought the crown was a man. I've seen portraits to the university. He shakes his head. First general, first general to command me kept saying he served a queen. I assumed he was high enough rank to know, but... Oka's words fragment, turning to about the incredulous laughter. 
We can't even be sure who rules us. If that doesn't just make a mockery of the whole thing. I've always thought the Crown was more of a collective council. So instead of just one ruler whose face we've never seen, there are many, Ioko says. Not sure I find that especially reassuring. I suppose we may never have an answer, you say, unless we're expecting a royal audience at the end of all this. Not likely, Ioko scoffs. The conversation subsides once more as the three of you followed a long trail back to the cavern, where you encountered the fractured root. Lantern light speckles its surface as you pass. You wonder whether the sample you gathered will yield any progress in your struggle against the plague. From the wounded root, it's a far shorter path back to the point where the passageway diverges. You listen for any sounds emanating from the right-hand tunnel, but all is silent now. Ewan Blake and the children of the dweller have no doubt dispersed to the streets and dwellings of Thornback Hollow, where they will continue to cultivate their devotion and secrecy. Let's return to Smuggler Camp. You shimmy and squeeze your way back through the narrow openings into the cavern where you made temporary camp. On the return journey, knowing what lies beyond, this claustrophobic corridor was far less trepidation. Ahead you see the covered alcove and the remains of your brief stay. In the distance you hear the familiar sound of the babbling stream. Though your legs cry out for rest, the three of you agree to press on. The desire among all of you to once again see the outside world passes unspoken. As you cross the stream's flowing waters and leave the largest of the underground caverns behind, Elka hands you a lump of chunk of salted meat. Thanks, you say, holding it up to the light. Illumination does nothing to improve its texture or appearance. The morsel remains grey and unappetizing. Been in my pack for a while, Ioko replies, his voice muffled as his teeth tug at an unhappy slab of his own. Best I can offer. Your hunger doesn't per permit you to be picky, and you make the sad, savoury piece of flesh last through to the chamber of sarcoph sarcophagi. The salt is still on your lips as the three of you form a tired, slow trio, walking your way back up the steps to the old quarter entrance. You have no idea how long you spent beneath the town, but as Ioko shouts that he sees the trapdoor to the outside, he realises it felt like an age. Alice stands in the winter breeze, stretching her arms to the sky as snow falls upon the whiskers of her fox mask. You feel Ioko's hand slap you on the shoulder as you both take deep breaths of air. The alleyway of the old quarter has never smelled like such relief. A few hours of trudging through white drifts put you back inside of the sanctuary. You look up at the branches of the ancient oak towers, their angular points raised and bare, as if beckoning the snow down upon them. I've seen the heart of you, you think to yourself. I've touched the shoes and vessels that bind you to this air. Lucy's voice carries across the street, rousing you from your fixation. Delighted to see you're still alive, they call, holding a feathered hat to their head as they hurry over. You need to accompany me to the rabbit warrens now. Their eyes flare with urgency. Okay, and that is where we're going to leave that one. So I hope you have enjoyed. Hope you are keeping safe and hope to see you next time. Goodbye. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, maybe consider hitting the subscribe button there on the right or checking out some other videos here on the left. Or perhaps you might even share with some friends.